Good afternoon, and uh, we are live for the last session of the Acre Webinar Week, and that's a bit strange because we did a lot of sessions, and but we're like we're going off with a blast because I'm here together with Elliot, and for people that work in the industry, you should know Elliot from United Advisors. We worked with them a lot, and um, but let me uh, introduce him formally. Elliot, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you, Arno. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us today in this in this webinar. Um, let me uh, do a bit of a formal introduction. Um, of course, we're doing Acre Online last session, but the good news is we'll be back within a few weeks. So we're going to do a lot, many more sessions over the next month because obviously, as we're all still in a kind of a lockdown, not allowed to travel, this is a great way to communicate. I'm joined by Elliot, financial planner. And Elliot, how long have you been with United Advisors now? I've been with United Advisors for around four and a bit years, something like that, potentially coming up on five years. Well, so you've a lot of experience, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with me. So as someone who's going to tell you a lot of things, what to do with your money, because, of course, Ono and Joanna are there. And I think uh, Joanna reserves a lot of kudos for what she's done over the past few weeks. So uh, everybody that wants to say something, put some kudos in the chat for Joanna. She deserves it. Did a lot of work, and I take all the... Good. Yeah, I think I got kicked out for a second, but I you did. Did I get kicked out for a second, Elliot? You did. You're back. Now. Oh my God. So, <laughs> but Joanna, as I said, a lot of kudos for Joanna. Uh, send her some love. Eh? So um, she did a great job. Um, but what are we talking about today? Financial awareness. Yeah. And we do a lot of these workshops during our physical events and they were very well attended. And normally a lot of people afterwards want to have a chat with one of the guys to look at like what they could do, especially in these times, because we know that a lot of you are either uh, without a job for a minute or you might have a, a decrease in wages or you're waiting for it. But some of you might have savings. There's a lot that to be done, but I'm pretty sure that Elliot will touch base on that. So that's what we're doing today. I want to give the floor to Elliot. Uh, so Elliot, please take it away. Enjoy. Guys, uh, put put it in the chat and um, any questions, any comments, I will make sure that if required, that we will uh, be uh, coming in and answering, asking you the questions. Take it away, Elliot. Brilliant. Thank you, Ono. Um, I'm going to bring up the presentation. And Ono, would that be visible? I've started that. Is that... Visible to everyone now? Excellent. Thank you. So yeah, I am uh, Elliot Krause and uh, I have been with United Advisors Marine now for, um, yeah, roughly four, four to five years, something like that. And I am, of course, here to talk to you about financial awareness. Um, and this is it's a really interesting subject matter for, for crew um, because crew are in an incredible position to do amazing things with the money that they do earn. Um, we work really, really hard for it. Uh, and what, um, to be had um, and that's a lot down to you know high income roles and low outgoings um, so that typically leaves people with surplus cash that they can do exciting things with um, it's just knowing what things to do and at what time to do them and the problem that we see quite often is that um, crew have either they're either time poor knowledge poor or a bit of both and that's where we sort of come into the fold where we want to help you on that financial journey. Uh, it may well be that you're just starting uh, your financial journey for the first time and you need the full suite of services as it is to, to get yourself going and on the right path. Um, or it may well be that you're quite well advanced upon that journey that you've taken and you want to have a little bit of a health check and look into how you've been doing things to date and can you be doing things any better moving forward. And, um, people at any stage uh, on that journey to, to have that conversation with. Um, 
And we always do have these conversations best in a one-to-one -one environment. Obviously, for the purpose of today, we want to give you a bit of a flavor of the sorts of services and the sorts of things we do help out with. But obviously, please do, uh, if you've got any specific questions or queries, we're here to have these one-to-one -one sessions um, after we've uh, after we've finished here. And, um, Everything is 100% confidential, so it's a case of the more open, the more honest you are, the more you're going to get out of um, the, the the process. So, um, in terms of what we're going to cover today, um, a bit more about who we are, what gives us the uh, authority and the credentials to be able to be sat in front of you and a partner of a crew traveling to all the different locations and giving these sorts of sessions to people. Um, I think it's really important that you know that we uh, are able to deliver that and deliver it with confidence. Um, we want to obviously talk about how crew do uh, with their money. That may well be money that they've already amassed uh, and it's sat there maybe in a 0% interest bank account of some description, or it's, um, you know, we're looking at to the future to say, how can you make more of the money that you will earn moving forwards. We're also going to touch upon um, your financial personality. Maybe wondering what, what does that mean? Um, everyone obviously is different. They've got different personality types and those different personality types will ultimately reflect on the decisions that you make, the financial decisions that you make. So um, I want to address if you understand which category you fit into, it may well help you make better decisions moving forward. And then key considerations. This is sort of uh, key questions as well. So ultimately, things that you can take away with you today, which um, you may be able, be able to implement yourself and should have quite an immediate impact. There's going to be resources we can go into more detail on that. Then last but not, uh, not at least, um, who wants to be a millionaire? So what do we need to do to make a million euros? Just as a, as a fun thing to look into. So, so who we are. So this is this is us. This is the, the team, and this is the team that's based here in Palma, Mallorca. And um, so, yeah, we are uh, exclusively focusing upon super yacht crew within this division of the business. Uh, we think that that's really important as well. With it being such a unique industry, there are lots of unique problems that come with that um, and with us dealing with people um, you know crew day in day out we're used to addressing those sorts of problems and hopefully you know we've got the, the solutions to those issues what we quite often see um, is that crew will maybe go to family members or friends uh, who are not in the industry and don't really have that in depth And, uh, firstly, independent, unbiased um, advice, but it's potentially not applicable or not the correct advice for someone working in the sort of environment that you will be. Um, we also have yeah, years of, uh, of uh, knowledge, years of experience, and uh, we share that experience collectively. Um, and we're also part of a wider group, just called the United Advisors Group, which is headquartered out of Luxembourg with offices throughout Europe. And again, really big on knowledge sharing, and we're utilizing all of those years and uh, all of that experience to make sure our deliverable is um, as good as it can be for, for our clients. So in terms of then going towards how we go about helping, crew um, there are these three pillars um, we call them of sound financial planning so the first one here is banking and it may seem like quite a basic quite an obvious but it's what people often get wrong um, so we'll be talking a bit more about that uh, we'll be touching upon tax but that really isn't our area of expertise we have partners that we work with from a tax perspective and that obviously depends on um, your country of nationality or country of residence at that time um, and they'll be you know very much specialist in that area so we can partner you with the right person if you would like us to and then we incorporate that into a, your overall documented financial plan the last but not least here is the savings element. This is where it starts to get more interesting, more exciting, and we can start to you know, plan for the future and some of those key goals and aspirations that, you, that you've that you got uh, moving forward. So the first section here on banking. Um, so let's use Standard Bank, the Seafarers account, as a bit of um 
used to count within this industry. Uh, some people have not had great experiences. Some people have had fantastic experiences. It's, but it, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this uh, example. It's a very, it's a good um, multi-currency account. It's exclusive to seafarers, and um, it, it, yeah, it holds. Uh, so you can hold up to four currencies. So uh, pound sterling less relevant usually, but uh, also euros and US dollars and Australian dollars, but the two main currencies that people get paid in. And it's really important that people do get paid in the same currency as what they're earning in. Quite often we see people who haven't even, they're not even fresh to the industry. Some people have been in the industry for 10 plus years and they're still, let's suggest maybe they're Australian, South African, British, whatever, and they're getting their uh, US dollar salary paid into um, their RAND account and then they're pay spending back in US dollars and it's money essentially uh, with one of these multi-currency accounts it's a good easy solution to that problem um, and also when it comes to the standard bank account as an example uh, it's pretty much representative of most accounts out there it's a zero uh, percent interest account where you can see on on the screen that says no interest so um, it really isn't going, it's not designed as a savings account. Also, uh, from an inflation perspective, so for anyone that doesn't know or is not aware of inflation, inflation is just the general rise in prices. Um, and in a normal environment here in Europe, it's about two and a half to three percent, something like that. Um, and it's going to vary, it's going to depend on where you're from as to what that uh, what that is. But for the purpose of this, and we'll, I've got some examples, we're going to use that figure. So uh, in terms of um, getting the best returns upon your savings, a nice round figure of 20,000 euros that sat in your standard bank account at 0% interest. Um, with inflation 3% in Europe, that means a 600 euro reduction in the value of your money per year, which again is just wasted money. So also here, if you were to do an investment of some description, even with a very low risk, um, and estimated growth of 4%, that would equate to 800 euros worth of growth in that same year. So always good to have a emergency fund, um, which again varies from person to person, but we recommend between three to six months worth of salary as your emergency fund and in your standard bank account or equivalent. But then when you're starting to think further down the line in terms of savings and investments, you really want that money to be growing for you, not just stagnating at zero percent interest it almost it, it, and it sort of compounded and it gets worse than the zero percent interest as well because if you are using then if you get have over a hundred thousand euros within that account you actually then get negative 0.45 percent um in terms of the uh, the interest rate so it's really not not ideal it's not designed for that purpose so i an example here to start to bring um, future financial planning and retirement to life a little bit. So, um, when we so there's an example here of John. He's 30 years old. He's a bosun. He's earning four and a half thousand euros per month. So he would like to be financially free in 25 years' time. So, at the age of 55, he wants to stop working and say, right, I've done, I've, you know, my a good time in the industry, and I want to now receive two and a half thousand euros per month. That's in today's money. What we then need to factor in is inflation because to have that same spending power, the two and a half thousand euros per month, it will need to be a higher amount. And we will actually come on to that later. Um, so he will need to um, generate a master fund of 1,254,000 euros um, in order to receive that two and a half thousand euros per month um, at the age of 55 okay so how does he get there um by saving 2000 euros per month now starting at the age of 30 at a in a cautious portfolio of five percent return give or take um he could accumulate one that uh, sorry one million uh, 170,000, leaving him with a shortfall still of, but a, a small shortfall of 84,000 euros. We're going to assume that, I mean, over the course of his career, he's going to continue to uh, improve and progress in his career, having higher levels of disposable income. And this won't be his sole um, savings. 
And there's going to be some there, there's going to be potentially some other things uh, which uh, needs to be taken into consideration. But now, just on the to take this and just to sort of iterate how important it is to start to save as soon as you can. If John waits another 10 years to the age of 40 before he starts contributing to his retirement, um, he'd like to be still financially free at the same age of 55, but now he's got 10 years less of saving time in order to achieve that. Still wants the same monthly um, income at 55, the 2,500 per month. Um, he'll need to create a master fund of 936,000 euros to have that same two and a half thousand per month in today's money. So if he were to save the same amount as the previous example of 2,000 per month for the next 15 years at the same 5% return, he'd accumulate 426 cents to be specific, um, which is quite a significant difference from what he uh, could have done previously. If I just go back, just to remind everyone, if he'd saved 2,000 per month at 5%, he could accumulate 1.17 million um, in that 25 years time. If he waits uh, and it's only 15 years, then he would uh, have saved 456,000. So leaving him with a shortfall of 479,289 and 34 euros. So he's quite some way off where he needs to be. Okay, we've got a bit of a um, a graph here to start to um, show this in a bit more detail. So, slightly different parameters here, but this is still a, this is a monthly savings required to build a million euro pension and retirement fund. Let's call it retirement fund. Um, so, along the bottom, a sixty. And then you've got uh, the amount of money on the, the left hand side. So if you're starting to save at uh, the age of 20, and this is for retirement age, at, 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 sorry, at the age of 65, this is not for retirement age at 55 of the previous example. But um, so if you were to start saving at 20, 360 euros per month would allow you to achieve that um, amount of a million euros saved by the retirement age of 65. If you start at the age of 30, then it would be 700 euros per month, 40, 1,435, so on and so forth. So the point being, if you are in a position to start to save sooner rather than later, um, then it certainly makes it that much more, um, that makes it that much easier and that much more realistic to achieve the, that 1 million euro goal, should that be a goal that you indeed set. Okay. So here for this section, uh, this is about your financial personality. And as I mentioned at the start, um, what we kind of what we want to get down to here is ultimately how would you categorize yourself? There's lots more categories than what I'm going to present and show to you today. However, this is just a, a bit of a flavor to start to get you to think. And perhaps you fit into uh, one of these categories, perhaps none at all. Perhaps there's a, a different one and perhaps there's more than one. But then we want, uh, want to understand, okay, what difference does it make actually understanding and knowing um, what um, uh, what personality type you are and what impact does that have to the financial decisions that you make? Um, yeah, why does it matter? So this cute little guy here, he is what we would call a squirrel saver. So we come across quite a few people like this within the industry that don't really have any particular any they're saving for they just know that it's something that they should do perhaps it's come from um parental influence maybe it's something that the mother or father has done and that's just been passed on but some of the pros to being this type of individual um is that you're they're typically quite reserved quite frugal quite conservative with their decision making um, they are long-term thinkers, again, not with any specific goal in mind, but they're just thinking usually about long-term, and they believe that they are financially secure. And they may well have a, a large amount of money saved within their 0% interest uh, standard bank account or equivalent, um, but in terms of the losses or the, what they're, you know, the returns that they're getting off the money that they've saved. It's not like it's invested in property. It's not necessarily invested in any uh, other particular investments. It's just there at 0%. Um, so some of the cons to that is 
there to ask about verse. They lack some direction um, and they'll get low returns on the, on the saved money. So just to bring this to life a bit, we, if we identify that someone is a squirrel saver, then we want to be able to help them to give them some direction and maybe take some risks, but some very well, you know, very well considered, very cautious risks that will still give them the comfort they require, but it will start to beat inflation um, and generate the money over time. Okay, definitely come across a lot of these people within uh, within yachting. So uh, these are the risk takers. So look, there's a lot of pros, but there's some quite serious cons with people that are risk takers and they need to be managed in a certain way. And if you, if you are one of these people, then um, uh, it's definitely good to be aware of that. So some of the pros, levels of fear, quite curious to, to new opportunities, uh, open-minded, and the potential for large returns. However, on the flip side, so usually quite impulsive, those <laughs> impulsive decisions can be quite destructive, and there's a much larger potential for significant loss. So um, these are the sorts of people that potentially, excuse me, potentially uh, were investing in Bitcoin, or maybe they still are, or some other cryptocurrency, or what is often perceived to be a bit of a attempt at a get rich quick kind of thing. Um, but not, not all the time, that's sort of on the extreme levels of thing. And people have made, if we use, if we take Bitcoin as an example, they've made um, huge returns in some cases, but also significant losses in others. So if, you, if you're willing to take the risk, then uh, the, the rewards are there, but, um, we would advise to, to, to do that with caution. And that would be part of the strategy that we would also do. Okay, this guy, he is a thinker and he is a, what we call a procrastinator. So someone that is sat back and they're watching what others are doing before acting themselves. So they're usually quite cool, calm, considerate and composed. But on the flip side, they, will quite often postpone and delay and miss some opportunities as a result of that. Um, so with feelings of potentially over, being overwhelmed, feelings of pressure and fear of failure. Okay, so here we have a dreamer. So the dreamer, they are big picture thinkers, obviously. They dream big, they wanna they, you know, very much live the high life and they're usually very much ambitious. Uh, they do, you know, a big picture th uh, thinkers, they really think small. Uh, uh, and some of the cons, they don't act upon some of the plans that they've got in the backs of their minds when they are daydreaming. Um, they're putting those ideas into an actionable plan to make those dreams a reality is often not one of their strongest suits. So again, really important for us to know that, to start to help them define that and implement it. So yeah, typically lack of focus for detail, and they definitely need some guidance and direction. Um, and this is the, this is the last one that we, uh, that I'll be discussing um, today as part of one of the personality traits. Uh, but again, one that we come across very, very often, and it takes them uh, usually quite a long time for us to actually engage and take the first step. But when they do, they're incredibly happy that they've made that step and they often say, I wish I'd done this 10 years ago. Um, and those sorts of people are potentially the, the head in the sand type of people. Where they don't want to accept or they don't want to address anything. They very much live in the moment and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but there just has to become a time where people are thinking and planning for the long term. So sometimes they, they're not planning for the future because they lack adequate knowledge to do so, to actually implement some things. Potentially a bit in denial because maybe they haven't been as diligent as they should have been to date, but taking the first step is, is going to take a lot of pressure off them moving forwards. So yeah, afraid of potential consequences and they're often unwilling to listen to good advice. Um, so, um, Ono, actually, I've, we've got a bit of a poll here. Um, I'd like to try to gauge with people out there that are watching mm -hmm. what category they believe that they fit in from these options. Just to try, just to try and get an idea. 
Okay, good. I'm going to launch a poll, guys. Um, that's going to ask you, are you a scroll saver, risk taker, procrastinator, dream, or head in the sand? And let's see what you guys say. So let's see what we have online. I guess we... Um, Let's uh, give you a bit of time to come up. Like, oh, we've got the dreamers coming in. That's, that's a dreamer. There will be more. Interesting. Yeah. So at the moment, we've got like 60, 60% dreamers and procrastinators, 25% squirrel savers. Just keep going. I'll let the poll run for a little bit longer mm -hmm. before we end so that everybody's got the opportunity to give an answer. Yeah, it's moving. It's still moving. It's a it's a tight race between the procrastinator and dreamer, right? Uh, it is. It is forty forty. It's a neck and neck at the moment. Yeah. Good. I'm going to end the poll, and uh, so these are the results. It's like a ten percent squirrel saver, forty percent procrastinator, forty percent dreamer, and ten percent head in the sand. What do you take out of that, Elliot? Interesting. No risk takers. That, that surprised me a little bit, but uh, no, interesting to see and. Um, the dreamers and the procrastinators as well. I think the procrastinator is a really interesting one because we do see that a lot. And um, especially in such close-knit environments on board, you know, where you are in the crew mess and such you know, close proximity to one another, um, there's usually there's, uh, you know, people that are quite outspoken that have gone through and done um, some pretty exciting investments, whether that be in property or um, with whatever it may well be. And people just sit back, listen, watch, and don't really necessarily know the right way to, to get involved. They know it's a good idea and they want to do something about it, but haven't quite worked out the best way of doing it. And it's great to see that they're actually here taking part in this uh, process. So hopefully they can, um, you know, hopefully we can give them some potential guidance moving forward. Great. Thank you for getting involved in that, guys. Um, so. Right, the next portion here, we're going to talk about typical life stages. So there are seven typical life stages that we would quite often see. Um, just to touch upon them very quickly from left to right here. So stage one, newborn, stage two, childhood, stage three, teenage years, and starting to think about what sort of career path uh, you want to embark upon. Stage four. So this is this is really where the first stage where we would normally uh, be engaging with, with any any of our clients. Um, these are young professionals leaving home and embarking on presumably their career in yachting. Um, they're start well. They're starting to get their feet under the table, starting to establish whether they are whether this career is for them. Let's assume that they they like what they're doing and they want it. They see it as a career path. Then they're starting to think about property. They're uh, starting to think about marriage. They're starting to think about children, tax. To some of these, because it will vary, it will depend uh, person to person. Um, but it's a very important stage, especially to get financial uh, advice, should it be available to you. Because if you can make a strong start within this industry with good habits, uh, and good discipline, then you're going to get that much more out of the industry for the for the long run. So, if, yeah, that, that's something to note. Um, and then, if then so coming on to stage five, this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated at times, a little bit more interesting though. On the same um, in the same way, this is a yachting professional with there's going to be some potentially more complex tax planning that needs to be addressed, inheritance. Um, planning, tax planning, so yeah, onshore migration, retirement planning, all the slightly more complex things that we'd start to address, um, but more exciting. Uh, the studies out there and, and my personal experience, and a lot of people will make some of the most significant financial decisions that they will ever make before the age of 40. Um, everything from buying your first house or maybe second or investment properties um, to getting married, having children, uh, maybe leaving the industry, starting a business. There's all of these different uh, options that are available to you, but some of the most significant. So, um, and this, these are some of the years where you are your, your least experienced. You haven't maybe done these things before and learned from any potential mistakes that you've had. So having an independent third party that can be a bit of a uh, sensor check on, uh, on your thoughts, but in, um, an independent and unbiased way is really important as well. For instance, if you have the same conversation with a family member, they're not going to have that same 
unbiased opinion as to what, what it is that you should potentially look to do. And then stage six is retirement. You know, reaping the rewards of all the hard work that you put in through stage four and five. And then stage seven is passing the torch, your skills and wealth to the next generation. So again, really important to make sure that everything's in place to make sure that that's as smooth and as stress-free as possible. Okay. So the process of how we actually get there. So the first stage and um, what is probably the most important stage is the defined stage. And this is, um, this is us understanding you. So we go through a very regimented process um, to understand where you come from, where you're at now, and most importantly, where you're looking to go. And we typically break that down into short term, medium term and long term goals. Um, and this section sort of comes back to that honesty that we mentioned, that I mentioned earlier on, um, to say that with everything that we do, this and open and honest you can be um, for better than what you're going to get out of the process. Uh, and this is where we're really starting to set out some wealth goals and, and starting to look um, about what kind of lifestyle it is you want to aspire to have. Once we've been through that, we move to the second stage, which is the design stage. And this is uh, this is really where we start to document all of the things that we've uh, that we've gone through and work out a bit of a strategy and a plan to make sure that the things that we've set out to do, are they achievable? Are they realistic? What sort of time frame are we going to do um, them in? Um, and that will be if, uh, in the documented financial plan. Um, once that's agreed upon and documented, then we will move to stage three, which is the refine and review. So ideally, we really want to be speaking with you every sort of three to six months, depending on you and the sort of pro program. But six to some people, it's longer, so it really does depend. But in those sessions, uh, we really want to, uh, this is us making sure that you are sticking to the things that we initially set out to do. Um, so we want to know, you know, has there been any changes in your personal circumstances? Some of the things like, you know, family changes uh, or, you know, maybe you bought property or some other investment. Um, it hasn't been any changes in your professional life. Uh, you know, maybe you've gotten a promotion, maybe you've moved boats, uh, maybe you've moved to rotation, anything like that that may well have an impact to the way in which we're helping manage your account. And then of course, during those calls or face-to-face -face where we're practical, um, during those sessions, we of course wanna be feeding back to you on the accounts that we're managing for you. So you know how much has been contributed, what the growth has been, are there any changes that we would recommend making? Are there any market movements or anything significant from you know an economic uh, level that should um, so yeah, that's that's essentially the process that we'll go through. Um, so the the duration of our relationship is usually very long. Okay, so these are some of the things to consider, some some takeaways for you. And there's actually a handout that uh, we can leave uh, with you after this, which is some of these questions, and then take it into more detail. So some of the basic things as well. So are you being paid in the same currency as your bank account, which we touched upon earlier? Are you filing a tax return when necessary? Do you have an emergency fund or cash cushion if you lose your job? And I mean, this is incredibly pertinent at the moment with everything that's going on with COVID-19, uh, a very unpredictable, um, unprecedented um, uh, you know, incident um, or that's, uh, that's going on uh, globally at the moment. A lot of uh, crew have lost their jobs or are on um, reduced salaries and that was If you didn't have your emergency fund or cash cushion in place, um, then potentially be struggling right now if you have lost your job. And what's even more worrying is that we don't necessarily know when everyone's going to be, when everything's going to be back to normal. Um, so this really it does uh, emphasize how important that cash cushion is. Um, but even in, under normal circumstances, let's say, say when we're not talking about a global pandemic, is that, you know, yachting is an incredibly transient industry when people, there's an incredibly high level of turnover of crew within the industry. Uh, it's not like it used to be uh, or is on shore when people keep their jobs for 10 years, 20 years uh, up to retirement in the same job with the same company. People do move around a lot and there's usually time off in between those um, 
but not always. And it's obviously a relatively high risk job as well where you can get injured. Um, so really important at that point. Um, do you set yourself a monthly budget and do you keep to it? Two very different questions. It may well be to pass, but keeping to it is a, um, is a different conversation. That's something that we will go into, de into detail in our process as well to understand what your income versus expenses are. And what I mentioned briefly earlier as well about your outgoings, compared to an onshore lifestyle, they're usually incredibly low. So being able to capitalize upon those healthy salaries with very low outgoings gives you a good opportunity to start to, to do more interesting things. And so do you have any current savings? Next point is important. Are you getting the best returns upon those savings that you've generated? Do you have a current financial plan and are you keeping to it? Um, what are your plans after yachting? So whether that be starting a family, creating a business, or just moving back onshore into a more traditional onshore role. Um, but it's really interesting for me to see because there are certain people just to uh, maybe earn a bit of money over a five-year window um, and utilize that to start a business or uh, start a family or you know whatever else they want to do but the only uh, we there's a lot of talk about these golden handcuffs within this industry where people have the plan to stay within the industry for a relatively short period of time but because they haven't planned um, adequately for the transition back on shore um, and they've sort of become accustomed to living in this little bubble um, where most things are paid for and maybe um, tax isn't, uh, well, you, maybe you don't have to um, pay a high percentage of tax. Um, but in any in any case, they can't transition back onshore successfully. So then they, um, they end up zigzagging between an onshore and, uh, uh, and a yachting life and, and sort of resenting a bit of both because they can't really commit. So, to stay within the industry short term, then right, let's make a plan to make sure that you can exit the industry as smoothly as possible to make sure that whatever it is that you want to commit to doing post yachting is a success. Okay, then next point is have you considered your retirement? Obviously, we've been into a fair amount of detail uh, about this already. Um, so, obviously, really, really important, especially in an environment where uh, I just touched upon tax, maybe you're not paying any tax or any social security contributions, so you're not going to get a state pension. Um, you do not uh, work for a big corporate or you know in a corporate environment, so you're not going to get a corporate pension. So anything that you do, um, save and invest, that is down to you. That is, it's up to you to make your own retirement. Um, and a lot of people, they seem to want to retire early in this industry. 40 45 something like that and if you're really going to do that and be successful at it then it has to be uh, well uh, yeah in a bit of a pickle but uh, so last point here do you know how much money you will need to achieve all of your goals and ambitions so really high level stuff but once we know that we can at least break it down and do some prioritization there so i mentioned earlier about um tax so these are some of the partners that we do work with. Uh, if you do have any specific tax queries, still put them to me and then I can make some um, relevant recommendations. Okay, and now the most important thing. So this is something, again, that you can start to take away yourself. So writing yourself a bit of a check to say, okay, if I want to retire at a certain time, this is what I'm going to need to do in order to achieve that. So I've got a complete, this is just purely for illustrative sake um, here. So if you write, this is a handout as well. So this will be because you can print out and you can write on yourself. So bank of whoever, um, if you put your current age there in the next box down, and then the number of years until you'd like to retire. So in this example, this person is 30 years of age and they'd like to retire at the age of 50 in 20 years time. So what they'd like to retire on is 2,500 euros per month. That's in today's money as well, because what we need to do is factor in that inflation figure as well. So the two and a half thousand per month, that works out as 30,000 euros over the year. 
And then if you see in the bottom left hand selection of boxes, it goes from five years to 25 years in five year increments. This is a 3% per year inflation rate factor. So if um, in this example where I've said this person at the age of 30 wants to retire in 20 so it times the 30,000 euros per month by 20 years. So it's a 1.8 um, factor in terms of what we need to multiply that by. So in at the age of 50, that will need to be worth 54,000 euros per month to have the same spending power as it does now. Okay, then what we do is we take a cautious portfolio of a 5% growth rate and uh, divide it by 5%. And that gives us our mother fund. So essentially what we need to create to um to to live off the amount that we've stated so that will create we need to create a 1.8 uh, sorry 1 million and 80 thousand um retirement fund so if anyone is struggling with um with going through this then i'm absolutely on hand to be able to help you start to calculate this and if we go through the uh the normal so the process that we would anyway, then uh, this will be something that I very much help you with. And then we work out what you will need to do in order to achieve that one million goal that we've set out to. OK, so that is it from from myself for today. I know any questions. That's a, some good, decent information. Uh, thank you so much, Elliot, for that. Guys, any questions? I know this is a bit like it's a, a lot of numbers, a lot mm. of personalities, a lot of types of, 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 of savers. I think it's like, um, is there anybody that has any questions? And if we don't have any, then I think it would be good to, uh, to make sure that like, to, that you can always get in touch with Elliot to ask any questions that you have. Eh? Uh, for now, we're just waiting to see if any questions pop up. And if not, then I think you did a great session because if there's no questions, that means you answered all the questions eh? during your session. Sorry, you, you broke up for a second there, Ono. Can you just repeat that? Please? I said if you uh, if there were not uh, not if there aren't any questions, that means that you've answered everything ah. during the session, <laughs> which is which is great news. Um, it was a bit of a bumpy webinar because uh, you broke up a few times, Elliot. Uh, oh. I, I don't think uh, that matters a lot. Galina is asking a question. Galina, by the way, Galina, you are the queen. You've been with us for most of the webinars all the way from Finland. So well done. And um, she asked what type of risks and what impact of it might be during the financial adventure. So what kind of risks are there? What impact do they have? So, I mean, there's, there's, there are risks inevitably with, with any kind of financial journey. And a lot of people are talking about what's going on globally at the moment, of course, with uh, COVID-19 and the impact that it's having to, uh, to there's been there has been a drop and that has there has been a sort of some level of short-term pain but however we're starting to see markets stabilize and return and well we will of course um in due course as well see things get back to where they were so there's always going to be uh, some ups and downs and some bumps that we need to navigate around and it's our relationship with you to understand what what's your acceptability level for for risks some people very very small some people the risk takers in the world they're more than happy to take a higher level of risk knowing that their potential for higher rewards are there so um it really does depend and that it's it's hard to predict exactly what risks um and what's going to happen in global markets um but all we can try to do is just be uh, that sort of one step ahead of everyone and we've got you know very smart people that we work with uh, predicting what's going to happen out there and then it's our job to reflect our client so it's very much a team effort um about uh, here but again happy to go into some more detail with you on a one-to-one -one basis with that great well thank you um thank you galena and megan yeah how do you account for unpredictability of our jobs in the terms of the possibility of losing one's job very quickly which would mean a loss of income for example is there a way to protect against or take into account the salary fluctuation due to COVID or any other situation obviously 
Sure, yeah, it's a very, very valid question and obviously very pertinent as it's happening at the moment. And that's why it comes back to that emergency fund and cash cushion that we would always encourage our clients to keep within uh, within their account. Um, within their account. So Standard Bank, we use as an example, having between three to six months worth of salary uh, in your account, should anything happen to make sure that you can weather the storm and that you are to rebuild the cash cushion again um, to a point where you're comfortable with it should something else unexpected um, ultimately happen. But there, there isn't really much else that you can do in terms of um, uh, planning for the unpredictability of the industry, uh, except be as good at your job as possible to the point where they don't want to get rid of you for whatever reason. Good. Uh, Valimer is also asking us, what currency do you suggest for long-term savings? It would be really dependent upon ultimately where you want to live and what currency you want. So let's take as an example that you wanted to retire to Sunny Palmer and um, and you were earning in euros at that particular time, it would make absolute sense to you know, have your salary paid in euros, your savings are in euros, your long-term investments and your plannings are in euros. So to have as little as possible and literacy transactions as possible, um, it's obviously gonna be very dependent for each person. Uh, a lot of people, they um, maybe wanna move back to their home country after they leave yachting. Um, in which case we would have to assess on a case by case basis to understand, um, you know, what currency you're earning, um, what currency is best to save in, and then ultimately what currency do you want it to be withdrawn in. Good. Well, thank you for that answer for the question. Giovanni, uh, Giovanni has said, do you offer advice on investments such as gold, silver, etc., or simply saving account with you? Yeah? She's pretty clueless set with the finances. Thank God she has a partner who's advised her well for property investment so far. So. Uh, so you are a, well, you're one of those property investors, Givany, like uh, all those properties <laughs> that you're like getting rent from, well done. Yeah? <laughs> but like, uh, what what else do you offer, uh, Elliot, instead of like? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, in terms of the investment and some of the, the funds ultimately that the money is invested in, Gold and silver and some other commodities will be will make up a part of those funds. However, it's very rare that we'll invest in purely any of those individual things. Again, what we try and do is um, de-risk and diversify as much as possible for um, for our clients. And by doing so, that means you know moving the money and putting it in uh, lots of different places to make sure that um, you know all of your eggs aren't in one basket. Um, but what we do and as part of this sort of discovery process and understanding the client is understanding if they do have uh, any particular uh, any particular sort of favorite uh, areas that they would like to invest in and on the flip side if there's anything they absolutely do not want to invest in and then when we go away and do our research and ultimately come up and find some options for you then it will be as close to um to what your preferences are good good and then uh, let's go for the final question for megan are cryptocurrency type investment a part of your financial portfolios no <laughs> they're not to be uh to be perfectly honest it's uh they're i mean there's lots of people that do incredibly well for them but um again we see them at the moment as too high risk uh we are more of the organization about planning for more sort of medium to long term, absolutely sometimes of course short term, but we want to be able to really predict what you're going to be able to withdraw and have at a particular time to make sure that the goals that you set out are realized and achievable. We wouldn't have very many happy clients if we were investing in what are considered to be very high risk areas when it gets to the point where they want to buy that property or they want to start their business or uh, whatever it may well be. And um, that, that, and did hope to, to realize good given he says that makes sense thank you for the for the answer that you provided to her earlier that's kind of you given you to give that response i think we had an amazing week and i'm happy Elliot, that we're like that we're like ending it like uh, with a with a very serious topic but a very interesting topic mm -hmm. i think everybody needs to look after the finances um 
I would like to thank everybody for joining in today. I would like, uh, Elliot, thank you for being with us. We're having this recorded, so we're getting it online end of today, maybe early tomorrow morning for you to look back again. Thank you again for joining us. Hope to see you next time within a few weeks for the next round of webinars. And stay safe and hope to see you in the flesh pretty soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Bye. bye.